so welcome to the patch management series uh, part two um, if you weren't at part one that's okay uh, there is a little bit of review at the beginning um, managing and maintenance so let's talk about patch management all right so let's go through this this content may contain for actually will contain forward-looking statements regarding future product plans and development efforts we're going to talk a little bit about roadmap um, however um, I'm not the executive vice president of product. Uh, product plans and priorities do change. So keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, let's go back. Oh, that's right. Okay, so who am I? My name is Jason Murphy. Uh, hopefully you've been to one of my boot camps previously, but if you have not, uh, I worked at Enable previously as a sales engineer and did some cool stuff. And then I decided to live the MSP dream and go work for a top 20 MSP, uh, roughly around 300 employees. Um, I was the technology and security leader, and I did a couple other roles. Um, then I left to become the director of managed services for a smaller MSP here in Ottawa. All in all, I've been using Ncentral for about a decade. I'm not going to read the agenda slide because that would be boring. Um, what we want to do is we want to, we want to focus high level on why patch is important, what the best practices are, and then we're going to talk about monitoring my favorite. I'm a monitoring guy. I've been monitoring for close to 20 years. My first monitoring system was Nagios. We had to script out all of your monitoring queries. Anyways, long story short, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to patch, when to patch, and what to look for. So this is really a best practice um, boot camp around kind of managing and maintenance. Okay. So a checklist for today. Um, ideally, in Central. You don't have to have in Central. In fact, some people do come to these boot camps from other RMM vendors, and that's fine. You can extrapolate a lot of what I'm talking around best practices and just Microsoft patching uh, and take that back. Um, but do have a notebook or a document, take some notes. One thing I will tell you is that, especially on the morning boot camp, people ask me to send them slides. I cannot send you my slide deck. Um, please, if you want to, take screenshots. Okay. Not supposed to tell you that, but here we are. All right, so resources available. We have the automation cookbook. If you need reboot scripts, for example, or Windows toasts, nag alerts, you know, prompting when people are 21 days up time and asking them to reboot to increase performance or what have you. There's lots of flexibility around reboots. So check out the uh, cookbook at success.n-able.com slash cookbook. There's close to 800 policies there now. Um, we also have our forums. Now, I don't run the Enable forums, but I do run our Reddit and Slack pages. So um, head on over to Reddit, ask me anything, okay? In fact, um, just before I, the reason why I didn't get the polls into the bootcamp is because I was answering a question on Reddit around Automation Manager. Um, and if you wanna check out Reddit, that's r slash enable. Um, MSP Institute training, if you wanna look at this bootcamp, uh, previous boot camps. Um, or even some of the other boot camps, by all means, head on over to success.n-able.com. Click on the MSP Institute. Over to the left-hand side, there's called Content Library. Click on that and then do a search for whatever you want. And again, my, uh, we have in central office hours. So if I'm going through anything and you have a question or if you want to kind of go through a best practice, um, my, my buddy Paul, um, who is in Ireland, um, looks after the in-central office hours, so head on over there and ask him a question. It's a ask me anything, a Q&A um, around in-central. And because we're talking about Patch, my good friend and colleague, Louis Pope, the head nerd for security, writes a monthly uh, Patch management blog. Uh, check that out as well. It is a huge resource when trying to understand what's going on with Patches. Okay, so what I do want to talk about is... What is coming for in central patch? One thing you will see in in central or should see in in central, let's use the word should, is Intune compatibility, right? So if any of you are trying to patch with Intune or manage your devices in Intune, uh, we had to create options for in central for OS patching and third party patching. So you will see that coming into uh, in central very shortly. Um, one thing we will be increasing as well is flexibility around out-of-band updates. 
uh, the ones that are 100% download only, those ones, um, they will now come into and central as well, which is a pretty handy feature. Oftentimes you gotta go grab the, the out of band update directly from the Microsoft catalog and then try to install it, not anymore. You're gonna be able to do that through in central as well. In PME 2.11 or 2.11, support for Office and Exchange updates. So install updates for other Microsoft products, the option that is in the OS support of Windows 10 and 11 Enterprise for virtual desktops. Uh, then we will be doing a few improvements around how we set up reg keys. We're gonna make some modifications to that and also RPC failures on devices, which have a, a slow NIC boot. Right, So a lot of people say, yeah, I can figure my device for wake on land, but you're still not patching it. That's because we're trying to hit it a little bit on the quicker side. So we're gonna obviously um, make some accommodations for slower NIC boots. Um, what else is coming? Oh yes, my favorite. We will be including the uh, CVSS scores into in central patch management. So you're going to be able to do approvals based on the CVSS score. So for example, if it's a seven or higher or eight or higher and you want that patch to go in right away, well then you can do that, right? So a good way to mitigate any security or like a zero day vulnerability or something to that effect. All right, so that's basically the roadmap for in central. Now, if you have questions, I do have the questions pane on my, <clears throat> pardon me, on my laptop. Um, which is not the screen that I'm using for my slides. So it is a little on the smaller side. So if you do have questions, just ask away um, or raise your hand. I usually see that on the GoToWebinar as well. Now, why is patching so important? Okay, there are three things that you need to focus on in patching. Patching the OS, patching the application, and patching the hardware. Those are th three things that we always tend to look for when patching. You know, you're doing third-party patch, you're patching the Microsoft Windows, and of course you're doing sometimes hardware drivers. What are we doing? Let's break it down. We're fixing vulnerabilities, we're increasing performance, we're adding new features, and of course, month to month, because sometimes those security fixes typically break things, uh, we are also fixing bugs and other, other problems. Okay, patching by customer or globally. I have this conversation with MSPs all of the time. In fact, I was on a call last week, in fact, where they wanted to reach out to me and say, well, we've got all of our patching at the customer level. In fact, we do a lot of things manually. You know, can you do a 30 minute call with us and set us straight? And I did. So they had uh, patch management architected at each and every one of their customers. Now, it wasn't too bad for them because they only had about 25 customers. However, um, I've managed 10, 000, over 10,000 workstations and laptops and then Central, and I can tell you, you cannot immerse patch management customer by customer. And if you have, you definitely want to look at re-architecting patch management from top down. That is how you should be leveraging the automation Sorry, there's a question here from James. I can't read it, so I'm gonna move it over here. Um, is that roadmap available in the Success Center? Uh, no, that roadmap is available by my voice and my voice only. So you can go to our, prob our public roadmap. So if you wanna Google it, just Google something like and Central Public Roadmap. Um, it should take you to our public roadmap. Um, I believe I had that fixed because it was going to a bunch of blogs earlier. Um, but with these kinds of things, I can't give you a, a definitive timeline on when they are coming. So I don't know if much of the patch roadmap is on, uh, on our website. Now, to kind of get back here, the reason why MSPs typically want to immerse patch under the customer is because they tend to think each customer is special. And to a certain degree, every customer is special. But let's be real, when it comes to patch management, it's typically rinse and repeat. Now, some customers are more nuanced than others. I was explaining this morning that I used to look after a uh, business here in Ottawa uh, that was uh, basically a contractor for the Department of Nat uh, National Defense. 
where they would do logistics. They would basically do airdrops across the globe um, for, for things like supplies. We'll call it supplies. Anyways, long story short, I used to I went in and started rebooting their th their servers on Wednesdays at 3 a.m. Well, apparently 3 a.m. in various zones of the world um, isn't always conducive. So you also have to take into account the customer need or want, but still build that into a top-down perspective because there might be another customer that fits into it later on. Okay. When onboarding a new client, review their patch needs and try to fit them into one of your current configs. You're not always going to be able to do that, right? You know, I've had customers like, you're not rebooting my devices. I want you to patch them, but I don't want you to reboot them. So I'd have the uncomfortable conversation of saying, did you know that patch management isn't patch management without reboots, right? You're not actually installing the update until it reboots. So I actually need to reboot your device. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, let's 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 think about it. when can you do it? Can you do it on a Sunday at 2 a.m. so it's not bugging my use? Well, your most of your fleet is work from home, so that's not going to work. Okay, because their their lids to their laptops are already closed. They're I'm not going to be able to communicate with them. Well, I could set them up for wake on LAN, right? But that's not ideal either, because then I have to finger fix every single laptop. So it's one of those things where I explained, I will work with you on a solution that works best for everybody, okay? And that typically involved working with the end user, asking them to reboot, and then I would take a harder line approach later on. If your device was up for more than 21 days, I would force reboot your device within a four hour window. Uh, try to stay between two and five patch configs now, I you okay so I started with two I then increased to five that was my best practice I've seen people with 15 and they love the way it's architected so you know it's entirely up to you how granular you want to make patch management for you and your customers now what I also like to talk about is defense right that is patch management you are defending your customer or even your MSP from those nefarious individuals like organized crime or you know certain nations that one's kind of near and dear to me coming from uh, my former employer um, cyber terrorists right so there are baddies out there looking to cause harm to things like power grids uh, there are insiders even IT people can be insiders hacktivists you know fun to read about but often do damage now how do we protect ourselves in this brave new world? You know, so I yeah, was making a joke, but it's one of those things where we have to patch our systems. And when I get to the next, next slide, I'm going to give you a use case as to why. Because I wasn't always technical. I have been, I've been in the system in since oh, 2002, I think. Uh, my first technical job was when, I was working at a call center in the year 2000, but I wasn't a sysadmin. But I started um, um, managing systems probably around 2003. And it was one of those things where um, I was managing a fleet of 1300 workstations, 300 servers, all physical, um, most of them running Windows NT, some were running Windows 2000. I was lucky there. Uh, most of the workstations were running Windows XP. Now. It was one of those things where um, I had to do all of that manually, right? I didn't have to really worry about security back in those days either, right? If I missed a month worth of patching, I'd patch it next month, right? Not a huge deal. But as the internet has become more and more dangerous, we have to be able to patch devices quickly. The reason being is that on average, you have about 15 days and I always give people uh, a primary example and that was Equifax. They had one Linux server, one Linux server. I think the application was out of date for 30 or six, 90 days or something. It was, it was at least out of date, but all they needed was a patch. A patch can prevent a breach. So it is one of those things where 
you know, I've worked with tenured IT directors who have told me, well, I'm going to give you a window between midnight and 4 a.m. once a month on the third Thursday to patch my devices. Okay, do you know that's not going to work? That's going to create more labor for me because I'm going to have to do more patching. I'm going to have to do things more manually. The reason being is that eventually on my automated system, I'm going to get out of date. And I'm going to go through some of this when we start talking about reboots and installs and everything else is that if you understand how Microsoft releases patches now, you quickly get out of date. Yes, we still have patch Tuesday, but it's usually patch month, right? Like if you look at the dates, just open up patch management and go to manual patching, the very first kind of uh, tile, you will see very quickly throughout the last month or the month before or the month before that, patches come out on more than just Patch Tuesday. Or they get reworked and changed. They have different timestamps. So you have to patch on a weekly basis, 100%. Now, that's me on my soapbox. Let's move on. By the way, great screen if you want to take a screenshot of that and use it in your own you know, sales demos. Okay. Why do you, why should you care about patching? Now, the story is, is that yes, I was technical once, but I decided to get into sales. When I was working for that big, big MSP as a um, technology and security leader, it was basically like a CISO role um, or maybe VC. So, you know, cause I was still working with customers quite a bit is that um, I would target patch here in Ottawa and well, well, a lot of customers across you know Canada and US, but it was one of those things where the first thing I went after was patch. I would take the InCentral probe, I would put it in the environment, I would run a scan, and within four hours, I understood all of the asset information and I understand all of the patch levels. And then I'd run a report manager report, it would tell me what was going on. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of MSPs that don't do patch very well. So you need to do it awesome. So MSP contracts always include patching. It's usually the first contract. The first thing that they want is they want someone to look after their patching. They've got either they don't have a, a guy or girl doing it or nobody's doing it, right? So they need somebody to come in there and patch their devices. Customers often use patching as a metric to see if an MSP is meeting its engagements. Okay, well, what are you doing for me? I'm gonna patch your devices. Okay, give me a patch report. Tell me what you're doing. Customers will sometimes run their own patch reports and see if you are doing what you claim you are. Again, I targeted patch. And about 50% of the time, I would notice that, hey, you're three or four months out of date. Oh, that's not good. Oh, it's not good. In fact, and I could show them Microsoft articles that were zero day vulnerabilities from two months ago. You know, like, so it's one of those things where, yes, you want to be able to patch your devices quickly and efficiently, okay? Is that what the patch reports in InCentral is for? To show a report to the client? Uh, heck no, no. Those are your reports, um, Ulysses. Um, what I would recommend is that the reports that are integrated into the Incentral system itself are technical facing reports. They're black and white, text-based. There's no love there. There's no real dashboarding. And that's something that you're going to pop over to your customer because it'll, it'll look like a, a Greek newspaper to them. I had a lot of childhood friends who were Greek, so I used to look at their newspapers and go, what the heck is that? Anyways, long story short, um, you do not want to give them highly technical reports. It doesn't mean anything to them. Then you're spending your time trying to translate it. What you do want to give them is an executive summary report, something that provides them a high level overview that they can look very quickly and go, oh, hey, you're getting a letter A grade or a B at least, cool. Or your levels are 85 to 95%. Okay, I can deal with that. When, the, when are you gonna do the other 5%, right? That is the high level dashboarding that you want to be able to provide them. And you'll see a lot of that when we introduce uh, analytics, probably later this summer or fall. Why is patching so complicated? 
Well, Microsoft makes it complicated. I'm going to blame Microsoft. I'm a big fan of Microsoft. Obviously, I've been in systems and supporting Windows devices for uh, a long, long time, well over two, two decades. <clears throat> so it is one of those things where I would not slag on Microsoft. Um, Microsoft, however, introduces some complexities around patching. So Microsoft and third parties often change their patching APIs. So we're always having to play catch up. Um, sometimes as often as monthly. Uh, some updates are disruptive. You know, upgrades, for example, uh, happen semi-annually, uh, which also require reboots. So they can be, you know, a little longer to, or I should say a little more intrusive to your customers. Some updates are as large as four gigs, pretty hefty. And Microsoft often re-releases updates due to issues and bugs. That's where all those timestamps I was talking about, right? They'll pull the patch and then put in a new one using the same KB. It's like smoke and mirrors, um, but it happens all of the time. If you start understanding how patching actually works from a backend perspective, it's a, it's a very kind of uh, a live entity. You know, patches are coming in and going out and getting updated and you don't really see it but it happens. A uh, variety of versions across customers. You've got everything on Windows 7, 10, 11. You've got things, I've got customers that are still looking after Server 2008, 2012, right? Vanilla 2012, not even R2, okay? Devices are not always available for patching. You know, if you have customers that are online from nine to five, you know, interrupting them during the day is sometimes problematic. However, you should be detecting, downloading, and installing during the day. Reboots. We'll talk as we go through. Now, patching best practices. One of the things I get to do as a head nerd, it's a pretty cool gig. Not only do I get to do these training sessions, what we call boot camps, um, or you know, meeting with partners over, over Teams calls. Um, I actually get to visit MSPs. I actually get to go to uh, industry events and try to understand you know, what the next greatest thing is. In doing so, I get to see what a lot of other MSPs are doing, okay? Now, let's talk about automatic versus manual. Okay, well, for the most part, I always use the middle option, what I call semi-auto, a little bit of both. I try to do all of the other things, or I should say, I'm more risk adverse. The reason being is because of, I've been patching for as long as I have. When you used to patch Windows NT, sometimes I used to do patch by patch. Not even kidding. There was no way I'd approve everything on an endpoint. I, I'd be looking for a world of hurt. But I knew if I did five and then six failed, I knew that I could hopefully roll that one back. Um, rollbacks back in those days were not like it is today. So because of things, you can go fully automated with patching in and central. If you want all drivers, if you want all service packs, if you want all upgrades, yes, set it to always update, fully automatic. Well, you can also want to maybe include some declines. You know, you may want to, you know, fully auto with some decline in there. You can do the hybrid patching model that I'm talking about. It's what I'm probably going to coach you mostly on today. Um, but there are MSPs who are perfectly set up for fully auto. Um, yeah, semi-auto with some decline, and then you the the last two I don't even recommend. Okay, so manual and not doing it right. Now there is no single best way. It really depends on what you're contractually obligated to do for your customer. Now, <clears throat> how do you decide which one is right for you? One, do you intend to install all patches? Like every month, do you have to install drivers? If the case is yes, then maybe you can go fully automatic. Um, I would be a little careful. <laughs> There's a lot of things that could go wrong with that. Um, I've managed SQL servers. In fact, I've managed fleets of single, uh, SQL servers. Um, if I had to, in a month, you know, approve a service pack, I can tell you um, I'm looking for days worth of work in terms of you know, rollbacks and fixes and everything else. You can't really go fully automatic on everything. Do you review and test your patches before you approve them? 
Do you have a test group or a test customer that you patch before everybody else? Do you read advisory notices? Do you read, you know, Lewis's patch, patch block? Do you want to patch everything or just some things, right? Again, you might have a service level agreement that outlines what patches you're going to install. Definition updates, security updates, um, criticals, you know, those kinds of things. Do you want to patch everything or just some? Or do you want to install drivers? Well, let's talk about it. Let's do a show and tell because I've done enough talking at this point that we can get into it. So let me just pull this up and enable. All right, here we go, my lab. So first things first, let's talk about approvals. If you go to configuration and then mon or sorry, patch management, you have automatic approvals, approvals by device or approvals by patch. Now, if you've ever gone through a bootcamp with me previously, I do not recommend doing by device at all. Reason being is when you're managing hundreds or thousands of devices and you're doing, well, I'll just show you. So I'll go into Company Corp and I'm going to install patches on these two, but not these two. Well, what happens is, is that when I go through the wizard, okay, it says pick your, you know, let's pick a couple of these, boom, boom, boom. When I approve for install and I click next, now I'm not gonna actually install those, but if I click finish, what I'm going to do is change the existing approval to approve for install. However, when I wanna run a patch report for that customer, it's gonna say mixed. I've got some patches installed or set to install. I've got some declined or some not approved. You have a mixed um, approval system. So I don't like get, you should be, a, look, it depends on what's happening with your devices. So it's you know not one size fits all, but typically you wanna create patch groups, right? So, and that really should be around the architecture of how you're setting out patch. So what I want you to tell you, here, give me one second. I just wanna go and do not disturb. Okay, sorry about that. So what we're gonna do here is talk about two methods which are automatic and manual. I still use this manual method. Oftentimes I want to do my own research because I can actually click in and see what is going on with the patch, right? So you can do your own reading. There's links to Microsoft articles in here. I can figure out if it's removable or not, right? So that'll tell me if do I have a bad patch? Am I able to pull it off? Okay. Now, somebody also mentioned EULA, right? I think that was Ulysses. So with Microsoft patches, no EULA. We have, have, a, we have the inherent permission to be able to push Microsoft patches. However, with third-party updates, if you're going to manually install them, and I'll just prove them for install here, well, then you can see that there is a EULA. You can read the end user license agreement. Nobody actually does, but you can select all and click next, okay? Now, if you use the fully automated version, it's inherent, inherently selected for you. Another reason to automate the third-party patch. So that is manual patching. One thing I will tell you, and I'll start over here, is I use this ribbon quite a bit. Right, so I'll usually go back something like you know, more than a quarter, go back half a year, I'll then filter on whatever I want to look through. So updates or upgrades, let's go security as well. And you can see everything here, right? Well, I'll go in and just select these patches and go through the wizard. Now, most people ask me, well, I select my patches, but I don't see my particular rule for my patch group. Well, that's probably because the uh, patches that you're selecting do not reflect the filter that is filtering in that, that rule. For example, if you select a server patch, 
and you've got a patch, a workstation rule, it doesn't apply, right? So in central is smart enough to rule out certain patches. Now let's talk about automatic patching. Did you know there is a hierarchy of patch in in central? Let's talk about that. As you can see here, I have things in the order, declines at the top, and then I've got my approve all, third party approvals. You know, I've got Surface Pro approvals. There is a hierarchy and is based on the tenancy in and central. If you approve any, the lowest number wins, by the way. Okay. So if you approve at the device, always wins. Device level is the cream of the crop, highest level. Okay. Because it's number 100. Then if you do a decline at a site level, well, that's above that, that's 200. So this would supersede this, which supersedes this, this, and this, right? You get it. And then when you want to do customer, again, you can take a screenshot of that. There is a KB article on this as well. So, um, but what you're gonna be able to do is come in and do 400, 425, 450, 475. You can't see these values. These are based on approvals in our database. Okay. So you can see the decline here, install, and then system. You shouldn't really be patching at this level. Hopefully not. But again, lowest number wins. So when doing approvals, you know, you want maybe the site or the customer to come first. This is, and all of these things happen chronologically. And you can actually take these things and, I didn't mean to click there, let's go back. You can see the little uh, compass that goes, I don't know what that thing's called, but we go put it at the top and move it right to the top. And you can move these all around, okay? Until it's green, if you get a red, it doesn't work. Where's red? There we go. Right, doesn't work. All right, so <clears throat> you can move these around, put them in order the way you want. And how I do it, declines become come before everything. And then I'll start doing um, my granular patching or my granular approvals first, like third parties or, you know, improving a certain patch for one customer or what have you. And then I typically get into my approvals or, you know, you know, based on how I'm I'm setting up my approvals. Okay, so this is a really important one. thing to note is that um, if you were doing an automatic patch at, at a customer, you can also come in and run rule now. Okay, so you can automatically enforce these rules immediately instead of waiting for maintenance windows. Okay. Any questions on, you know, approvals in NCentral? Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay. Now let's go into one. So one thing I will tell you as a best practice is that do not put Microsoft and third-party patch into one single rule. You need at least two. There's a minimum of two rules, okay? So again, if I come back, oop, get out of their news. I don't know why I haven't removed that yet. Um, but here I'll go into approve all. You can see that I've got all my third-party updates in with my Microsoft. I did not create this one. So I like doing Microsoft patching as its own rule. Criticals, definition, security, update, rollups, updates. You can do upgrades if you want. I'm still one of those people who do them on the quarterly. So it's one of those things where I'll leave some of this to later. Third party will have its own rule. And then I'll start breaking out Microsoft classifications the way I need to. So I'll go into, are you Microsoft? I'll go into ASP.NET, prove that. Office, prove that. And again, if I come into 2016, or are you 2016, and select, and then what I'm going to be able to do is say you install Office 2 2019, and that's sitting in here. Now, I don't have that in my lab, so it's not in here. But if I did, and I wanted it, I would select the parent as well, right? So again, if you select the parent, for example, if I was an open, adopt open uh, JDK and they come up with version 12 and I have the parent selected, 
that might actually install over version 11. So you do have to be careful with some of this stuff, right? Third party, I typically just pick the product and then I'll review it quarterly or every six months to see if there's new products in there, okay? Um, Ulysses, are automatic patches approvals at the SO the most efficient? Yes, it is the most efficient. However, it also gives you the opportunity to do things like declines at customer level. Even though I'm doing approvals at the SO level, I'm still doing my declines at the customer level as well. So what I do here is I will go down to, and this is only for approvals, is that I will go to Leonard Potts Potts, and then what I'm going to do is if I go into patch management, well, there's no devices in there. So let me find a, let me go into, I'm gonna find something that actually works here. Go to Marky Mark's Flying Circus, see if there's a device there. Patch management. We're good. And then what I can do here is um, these and select a product, select and apply to children. And then I'll give it uh, a name, uh, block this patch at this uh, customer. Okay. And then if I go back up to the top, oh, I have to go through and okay, and put a five there. Now, if I go back, back up to the top and I go into my approvals, you will see it added here. And the same thing works for the, the the customer level or customer level. The same thing works for sites as well. It depends on where you're going in and central to approve or decline or what have you. Now, I, when it comes to installing a patch, I like to do the installation of patch at the top level because if I don't have anything over approve, um, if I don't have any conflicts, Everything should be a 625. Now, if I'm doing a, a decline and I'm doing it at a customer or at a site, I know it supersedes. Hopefully that makes sense. And why should there be a separate rule to that of third party and Microsoft? Well, as somebody who's used in Central for 10 years, I can tell you, and I've used this in production, like as an MSP, um, you will have to rejig your approvals from time to time because a new customer comes in and you can't install Java 7 or Java 8, right? That's where you have to decline, but yet you have to install it for everybody else, right? So with third party, you may have multiple third party rules for multiple customers. So that is where you the granularity happens. You still wanna architect it at the top level so you can manage it, but when you do third party, that's where things, I mean, there's close to, I think there's 70, 75 third party products. It's not gonna be one size fits all for everybody. Now, if you only have 500 devices and in central, and maybe today it is. Five years, five years down the road, it definitely will not be. So it's one thing to consider breaking out Microsoft from third party. Okay, just that it's the granularity best practice piece. Um, any other questions on approval? Because we are going to move on. Now, scheduling of patch uh, windows, okay, maintenance windows, a detection. Okay, typically, a recommendation would be daily at a time where a computer is typically online, 10.30 a.m. for an example. Um, I will tell you, it is probably the most important step in patch management, detection, twice a day minimum. Doesn't matter if it's a server or workstation or laptop. Twice a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. If you're not doing that today, set it up to do detection twice a day. Reason being is that your endpoint will get a new patch two days from now, five days, seven days, whatever. Microsoft is releasing patches all throughout the month. So it's one of those things that if you want InCentral to understand that there's a new patch for it, it has to communicate back to InCentral. Now InCentral does do this natively. Okay, 
there is some asset detection that goes on and central will try to keep it in the now but if you need things to be real time for example if you go into that wizard that manual wizard by patch and expect everything to be there across all of your endpoints well detection is what it is going to keep that library up to date okay so very important step back caching okay now i like to use schedules personally like once a day is usually good enough once in the morning once in the afternoon in fact installs what other msps do daily weekly monthly daily weekly fine monthly heck no do not do this in fact i'm going to do one thing here let me go back to my slides because it almost looks like i use this to kind of talk through some stuff but let me get rid of this and i'm going to do a little font change uh, where's font 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 because i'll do the double strike there we go because you do not do monthly anymore again for probably the 10th time microsoft is releasing patches throughout the month and this was probably a good segue into explaining what i mean patches come out mostly on patch tuesday however others will trickle in throughout the month or microsoft will pull a patch and then fix it and still use the same kb i can probably even go into in central and find an example of a windows 11 patch there's four, four different patches all with the same, same KB. And they did not all come out on the same day. And you're probably scratching your head is like, how, why would they do that? I don't even know, but they do. So it's one of those things where you do not want to leave patches to a, a four hour checkpoint once a month. Then what happens is if your say patches are coming and most of the patches are coming out on patch Tuesday, then some will trickle in after you're patching on the third Thursday of the month. So there's a whole other week and a half where patches can come out. Say there's four or five. And then those four or five have to wait to the next third Thursday. And then the next third Thursday. The problem is, is that other patches have to get superseded. Definition updates is one of them. So you, you will quickly run out of, you'll quickly get out of date at least by three, four months. No, I have a lot of partners saying, oh, well, I patch monthly, I never have any problems. Okay, well, maybe you're lucky. Um, depends on your customer devices, depends on what's going on with Windows, what applications are installed, a whole bunch of other things. So I will tell you, you will get bitten eventually if you are just doing monthly patching. Okay. How much downtime should the best practice for any endpoint to install a patch? Should there be an additional downtime for servers? Well, We'll talk, let's talk about reboots as we go through. We're, all, we're almost there, uh, Ulysses. Um, but downtime is a major consideration. It is the most important consideration to your customer or the person who's you know, paying your, your invoice every month. Um, they want their employees to be as productive as possible. Scheduling of workstations and laptops. How to decide when to schedule workstations and laptop patching tasks? Does your contract or customer require you to install patches within a certain number of days? Like seven, 10, 15. They might not require, they, don't, they might not even know that you need to patch devices. It's just part of your service. Do you need want to delay patches for a few days to cause, to avoid causing harm to the end device? How old and performant are the end devices? This is a major consideration I actually had. Uh, a girl asked me this, this morning is like, how many, um, how many systems should my, my uh, tech be looking after for patch management? That's a really tough question. Like if you've got a lot of customers who are using i3 processors and the laptops or workstations are four or five years old, you're gonna spend more time Patches are gonna fail, like it just takes longer to patch. You know, there's inter more interruptions. It's, you know, you could have a platter drive for whatever reason. How tolerant are the end users to downtime? Ooh, the, let's, let's, let's go into that as we go through. We'll talk about reboots. Um, will your customer tolerate a midday reboot forcing them to reopen all of their apps? Nobody likes to do that, including myself. My IT, my IT department, 
rebooted my device uh, must have been four or five months ago. I don't know what happened because normally it's pretty seamless. But in the middle of the day, um, I got a notification that my device had to, to reboot. I was like, okay, whatever. But I had to spend like 15 minutes just getting back to where I was, right? Nobody, because oftentimes the things that are open on our workstation are the things that we're working on, right? There's, we're juggling a lot of balls in the air and just closing everything is, is really um, intrusive. Scheduling of servers. Detect, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, patch detection, again, twice a day. Uh, caching daily at night, two o'clock in the morning if you want, doesn't matter. Install, doesn't matter, right? You can install during the day, you can install during off hours if you want. Now, reboots. Let's talk about reboots because we're almost there. So, what do other MSP do? Typically, they wait for weekends, you know. There is something called read-only Friday. I do not recommend rebooting servers at Friday night <laughs> unless you want to do stuff uh, Friday nights and Saturday mornings. <clears throat> but, you know, typically in off-peak times, I used to do Wednesdays at 3 a.m. That was kind of my best practice. You also may have to reboot in groups as to not interrupt the uh, service, right? So rebooting DC1 versus DC2, I can tell you. I used to reboot both DCs at the same time. Never a problem. But some people are very much method more methodical than I was. And you can do that in N Central. You can really create patch groups the way you want to. But you can get very granular. We're going to talk about that as we go through. How to decide on when to schedule server patching tasks. Does your contractor or customer require you to install patches within a certain number of days? How old or performant are the servers? And again, if you're you know trying to patch server 2012 or server 2016 and older hardware, you know if you've got a server th from 2017, probably not in the best shape. You know, uh, what time uh, what time windows would allow reboots to avoid end uh, end users to downtime? Let's let me read that again. What time windows would allow reboots? Pardon me, one second. My, vo <clears throat> my voice is giving out on me today. Okay. Um, what time windows would allow reboots to avoid you end users to downtime? Okay, I have to rewrite that because it doesn't even make sense, but um, your end users are sensitive to downtime, right? So when, what, are, what are the best windows? There isn't a good one. First of all, that's the answer. You know, if you ask a business owner who runs a nine to five operation, when can I reboot your your devices and cause you know 15 minutes of downtime they'll be like yeah never i <laughs> know i don't want you doing that well we kind of have to sometimes right so you have to work with your end user around these interruptions scheduling of servers again went through that okay patch profiles let's go through it really quickly I did this one on my previous bootcamp, but I'm going to show you really quick and in central because there's two ways to get to patch profiles. So one, you can go through patch management and create your patch profile. You give it a name, you go through the wizard, and basically it'll create the rule for you with all the configuration with all the maintenance windows that you set up. Then if you come into patch management, you can also see here patch profiles patch caching this is your probes patch enabled rules pending patch approvals okay so all of this information is super important people ask me all the time well it's working on this group but not on this group well let's go into the profile so you scroll to the problem or scroll to the bottom and then click on the bc profile you know, maybe they're not getting pop-ups, right? Or maybe you have this set to zero where it bypasses the probe completely, right? So there's a lot of flexibility in how patch behavior works in NCentral. And also remember, because we're adding new stuff into the profile, you may want to, you know, review them and, you know, select some of the new options as well. Okay. 
go. Now, configuring your patch profile, let's go through it. All right, so if I come back. Again, this will announce pop-ups to the, your end users, alerting them, alerting them that there are patches that will be installed. Okay, so this is all around installs. Is it necessary? Nope. I never let people understand detection downloads or installs. Definitely reboots. Work with your end user on the reboot, not on this, because in my experience, think, same thing with EDR or AV. You start doing notifications and pop-ups and people start wigging out and they're non-technical typically. They don't know what things mean. You're installing patches at two o'clock in the afternoon. Then there's computers slow and they're blaming you because you're installing patches. And typically patches, you know, if I was to take Ulysses computer right now, set up patch, and he never knew what my frequency was, he couldn't tell me when I was patching the device. I guarantee it. Okay, so it's one of those things where you gotta be careful with some of this stuff. Communicate externally for updates. You know, do you want to use a probe? Well, fail over after five minutes. If the probe doesn't isn't there or if it's not working, you know, fail over to Microsoft. Run the misinstall window when the device comes back on. Okay, so, you know, when they're on vacation, they come back after a week, let's install around the time they want to have a cup of coffee. Who gets access to Windows Update? You know, everybody? No. At least administrators and or just and central. I used only, only this option, by the way. Patch, det patch detection, 99% of the time, it's always gonna be Windows Update. If you have a customer who is blocking Microsoft, this does happen. Um, people use the offline patching method all the time. So if you want to go out to enable, sis.n-able.com and pull down Microsoft patches from another non-Microsoft source, basically our Windows Update server, then um, you can do that using this method. Okay, in terms of PME, do you want the GA version, which is generally available, or do you want the RC, which is the beta version? And then wake devices up from sleep or hibernate. That is the patch profile. That's how easy it is. Using custom properties. Now, why use custom properties? It's called granularity, flexibility. That's what custom properties are going to bring you. Now, a lot of people get confused about custom properties. Don't, they're simple. Let me watch, walk you through some of the use cases around patch management. Now, what do they do? They allow you to apply patching rules in bulk. What does that mean? Okay, so for example, you have 100 workstations at a customer, but three of them are lab devices that you cannot patch. Well, how do you even create that filter? Well, you do it using a custom property, okay? Have default values and set list of options, a dropdown list. Well, I'm gonna show you the dropdown list as we go through. I'm actually, I'm talking through it, but I'm gonna show you in a moment. Easily create and modify device exceptions, again, you know, 97 devices out of three are going to get patched. Create test groups, right? So maybe you want to test, you know, a particular larger customer that has, you know, say 400 workstations. Well, you're going to do tests on 10 or 15 of them. That's your test bed. Allows to split devices based on roles. Okay, so like DC1, DC2. Let's go into it. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of this and pull this up. And first things first, if we go to the all device view, I'm going to filter on my, I have my lab right here, tray research. I've got my laptop, my work laptop right here. And then I've got some switches and routers. Then I've got some servers and a workstation. Perfect. Now, all I want to do is I want to go to um, administration. And I'm gonna go into custom properties. And I've already created it, but it's called patching the days of the week. Okay, you got Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You can see that Wednesday is the default. Now, this could be reboot days of the week. This could be installs day of the week. 
This could be whatever you want it to be, whatever day of the week you want to do your function on, right? This could be DC1, DC2. So there's so much flexibility around, this could just be called you know, patching DC. You know, and then you got DC1, DC2, right? So there's flexibility and I'm gonna show you why, because from here, you're going to select the customer. So I'll do Dell test customer or uh, custom company core. And then here, I'll just unselect those because this is my lab. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the all device view and then I'm going to select my last servers like that. You can see I got two over here, mostly this group. Then I'm going to go to custom properties. I'm gonna go down to patching by days of the week, select Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, right? It's all right here. Now, when I built that, if I hit cancel, custom properties, days of the week, I set my default. I created Wednesday first. Right, so Wednesday was my default. I am everything, every new customer that I get is always gonna fall into a default. Well, I can quickly fix that by going to another customer. So I'll go to Blue Sky Group or something like that. And then I can set them to a Monday. So customer by customer, I can get granular with how customers are getting reboots or getting their installs. How, how do all of that happen? It happens because of a filter. So I go to configuration and filters. Patch by days of the week. And then I can go wins. You know, actually let's pick a Friday. We did talk about no change Friday, but we're gonna get risky. Okay, then I can go like this. I can go by device and I want to find custom device property. I want to go into, of course, patch day of the week, boom, equal to, and then I can say Friday, filter, done. And then I can add you know, other criteria if I want. I can add, it's a server or whatever. I can add additional criteria, but in this example, I'm just going to remove it. So this is the device. The filter should find the devices, right? The filter should group them. And then once I'm done, all I need to do is pull it into a rule. So if I go into rules, add, I'm gonna call it patch installs by day of the week, something like that. And again, this is where I can go, you know, Friday, something like that. So you may have multiple rules where it affects different customers at different times. Anyways, there's about four or five steps. We have a whole boot camp that goes through custom properties. If you've never been to it, please come go to success.n-able.com um, and look through the events and look for the one for custom properties because we spend two hours on custom properties. I'm doing a, a quick five to seven minute rundown on it. But if you need more information, if you're not familiar, don't worry. Okay, there's a lot of use cases around custom properties in, the, in that bootcamp. Okay. Patch status V2 monitoring, how it should be configured. Now, I'm pretty militant about monitoring <laughs> and patch. So, your guys are gonna have some questions as, as I go through. Um, what I can tell you is if I come into, uh, where's my end central server? It was right here. There it is, okay. So what I want to do here is, bear with me for one second, go to service templates. Uh, I'll pick on workstations because they're right at the bottom then I don't have to search for them. Okay, and then I'm going to go to the Windows default, right? And this is what the default patch status v2 monitoring looks like. It's include everything in the reporting. It includes all of your patch priorities, 
It includes default age. It includes notify me if a patch has not been actioned, which means um, if you've approved Silverlight and it hasn't installed for whatever reason, it tells you it hasn't been installed in 1300 or 1800 days or something. Um, or any, any approved patches not successfully installed during the last patch window. This will tell you if you have failed patching. Now, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm not a huge fan. I really don't care if patches fail. I'll explain why as we go through. And Ulysses, you have about three questions here, so let me just address that here in a moment. Um, medium priority patches, notify me if it has been actioned. Same thing with my medium priority, you know, failed patches, low priority, not haven't been actioned. Again, low priority patches that have not, you know, that have failed. What I do is this, off, 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 and off. Now this is only in a service template. At a device, the, the sorting of, of all of these is different, okay? So just know that in a service template, they're all from priority, priority, high priority patches, mediums, then low, and then you get into what I call quality. I wanna know if there's a reboot required. I wanna know if Windows Update Agent status has a problem. I wanna know if high priority patches, monitor missing patches based on age is an issue. That's what I care about. Is that critical patch installed by day seven, by day 10, by day 12? If it's not, then send me an alert, then create a notification, then create a ticket. That is what I care about. Do I care about a patch that fails because there's a superseded update? No, I don't. Because I would say nine times out of 10, failed patches fix themselves. 100%. And I've run tens of, I've run over 10,000 workstations and laptops in N Central by myself. And I can tell you in most cases, unless you're having WUA problems or PME problems, failed patches happen because of one, Microsoft. Okay, but they typically fix themselves by the next install. That's why as I go through, I usually recommend two installs a week. Okay, one on a Tuesday, one on a Thursday, for example, or Monday or Wednesday. Now, I, I have partners that do installs twice a day, so it's entirely up to you. But this is how I set up patch monitoring. Now, it's this that is the most important. Okay, this is disable, 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 and then you leave everything as defaults, but it's this that needs to be configured. So details, turn this on, what are you contractually obligated to patch that customer? Everything? Probably not. If you in your if you're in your managed services contract are saying I'm going to patch all in Microsoft, you got to change the verbiage because you're not. You should not be, anyways. You may be. That's a lot of heavy lifting, right? If you're trying to get you know a month's worth of drivers installed by Patch Tuesday, you're going to get burned eventually. <laughs> That's all I can say. So it's one of those things where you want to come in and mitigate the risk, but also provide as much value as possible. Something like this. Critical security. I do include unknown. Update, update rollups. And that's basically it. These. Okay. You can also include upgrades. There's a lot of partners that do automatic upgrades. And if that's the case, include it. Okay. But if you're doing this more manually, once a quarter, that kind of thing, then don't. Then you come through, uncheck. So you know, instead of being read-only, we're gonna edit. Critical security definition, they're all high. Third party, I'll move to low or medium. Depends on how you wanna do it. Drivers, not monitored. Feature packs, not monitored. I don't need Windows 11 upgrades, you know, alerting my ancestral dashboard. I need to know if patches are getting installed. I need to know if that critical is installed by day seven. That is quality. Uh, tools. Nope, I don't care about Bing bar. I just don't. Unknown. I will leave it to low. 
Microsoft will classify, and this is something that unless you're in the now or in Microsoft patching, is that Microsoft will release patches into the wild as unknown. No classification, no priorities, just unknown. So I would recommend keeping that at least to a low because typically over the course of weeks, they do fix it and then classify it as critical or as a definition update or what have you. Why they do that, I'm not entirely sure. Update rollups, I do medium, medium, and then upgrades, I'll usually put a low, but some people like keeping this to medium as well. And that's it. All I need to do is set up my frequency, 10, 20, 30, that's basically how I used to do it. Now, I also used to keep a three-day delay on my, my patch approvals. So I had three days to make sure that if there was a bad patch from Microsoft, I would catch it. But I was always reading technical articles or getting emails from TechNet or what have you. So I kind of knew what was going on with patch every month. If you're not that person, maybe set this to 15, 30, 45. It's entirely up to you. I've seen people go as high as 90. Okay, so it's entirely up to how, how you want to have alerts in your face. One thing to consider is that when we go back into patch management and approvals, you will see that there is a delay option, right? So again, three days. I have, I've seen people do 20 in here. So if you're one of those people who are adding an additional 20 days from the time of the release of patch, then what you want to do in your service template, go all the way back to this. Come back. Bottom. Oh, right here. Then you add 20. So if you want actual seven, it's 27, okay? That's with a 20 day, an extra 20 days delay, right? So this is how you mitigate risk. This is how you ensure quality. Hopefully you'll at least look at architecting uh, patch monitoring the same as me. Now, okay, let's look at um, Ulysses questions here. A bit of a late question, but is turning off probe cache the best option for a thousand to two thousand devices, which are not always on site near the probe? Well, I would say you do both. If there's ever a chance, like you were talking about one or two employees coming to the office, okay, no. You know, if most of if mostly everybody is working from home, <laughs> there's no point of you even using a probe. However, if you they're hybrid and people are coming in and out of the office, then by all means use the probe. It's in the patch configuration, set it to a two minute failover. Okay. You may even have to extend your, your patch um, download or installs, depending on the bandwidth. It depends on where you live, uh, Ulysses. But it might be one of those things that if you're in a low bandwidth situations, patch downloading of patches might take over an hour. So give them 90 minutes. So all I'm suggesting is be a little flexible with some of that. Okay, is this custom properties patch configuration different similar to that of the configuration automatic patch profiles? And is it recommended for big environments? In fact, I would say when it comes, not even big environments, almost every environment, <laughs> um, you want to start getting very familiar with custom properties and patch management because it offers you a lot more flexibility right? Um, patch day by days is one example, right? Um, you could have a custom property that is maybe your zero day vulnerability patch uh, priority, uh, custom property. No matter what, you drop that customer. You, here, let me just build it. Maybe I already have. I've done this example before. Just like this. So by default, you have this set to disabled at all times, okay? Then there's an immediate vulnerability that comes out. All you're going to do is now patch enable, right? You're gonna change the default 
So everybody is going to get patched right now. That is how important custom properties are in patch management. The more you get familiar with this, right, and the architecture of, of, of custom properties and how do you use them and what use cases may, may be out there, again, there's a whole boot camp for that. Um, I would recommend you would want to do this not only for big environments, but even small ones. Okay. Go through. Patch monitoring. Okay. Well, we talked about that. Um, you don't want to generate unnecessary alerts. You know, your default thresholds are assuming that you're, um, you're weekly patching, at least weekly, daily to weekly. Um, use notification delays as well. If you go into the notification profiles, there's a section where you can actually delay notifications. You know, maybe you're going to wait 10 days, five days. If the surface goes misconfigured, go through the troubleshooting steps uh, as Windows Update is likely failing. There are scripts to fix that on the cookbook. Okay, so again, go to patch management in the cookbook and you'll see all the reboots and everything else. Um, okay, so I already did this for patch monitoring. Um, getting patching up to date. So how should this be configured? Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you. So what you can do is, like I said, patch catch up can be this, right? Think of this as like onboarding. Well, you have a customer that is severely out of date. You know, they old MSP, they have, um, you know, four months out of date, but you want to get them caught up, right? So what you can do is turn on these weekly maintenance windows by turning on patch enable, right? Again, default is this for this particular customer, right? So try and turn it on. And then basically what that does is enforces patch management with all the maintenance windows and everything else. And they're gonna get patching the way that you want them to, okay? Once you're done, flip it back to patch disable, sorry, patch disable. I don't need that. That's an architecture diagram of InCentral. Uh, patch on demand, which sounds a lot like um, getting patching up to date, but has a different use case. And let me explain this one. So if you go into InCentral and you go up to the all device view, all I need to do is say, okay, well, I know I've, this is like doing by device, right? I've got these servers, I, they all have the same Intel driver, right? I'm going to go through and, where are you here? Add task, and I'm gonna say, um, so there's other types as well. You can do a PME install and reinstall. You can do patch reboots on demand. So you wanna schedule a reboot at three o'clock in the morning tonight, that's where you use this. Patch detection, right? So again, that's how important it is. It even has its own patch detection window that you can set up or patch on demand, which is basically how to install, right? So I'm gonna choose everything. Maybe there's one particular patch that falls under security. Maybe I'll just choose that. And then what I'm gonna do is choose again, once at tomorrow, which is kind of tonight at zero three, And then maintenance window should last for 120. Yes, I wanna reboot at 3.30 in the morning. And then I'm gonna force without user notification during the maintenance window. So no matter what, it's going to reboot with and get installed within the maintenance window. And then I'm gonna force it at a downtime after 125 minutes, which is, you always wanna set it at least one minute after the maintenance window. Um, forcing a server out of downtime basically means you're going to put it into a, so basically it suppresses alerts, okay, puts it into the disconnected state, but eventually when the server comes back up, you want to pull it out of that disconnected state and then click save. That's it. That's basically installing, right, whatever uh, available patches are out there that you've approved for it. And one more option is the patch catch up config. Again, what you can do here is, oop, come back. Holy smokes, I'm not good at 
clicking today. So you can create an aggressive patch configuration following this best practice. Think of this like an onboarding. I had an, oh my gosh, I'm clicking all over the place. Come on. Is basically um, you're able to um, create maintenance windows where uh, you're detecting hourly, you're downloading basically, you're saying no, but basically that means immediately. Um, so as soon as it's approved and you actually go to install, it then downloads and installs. Um, installs either every two to three hours or as soon as you approve them and then reboots, you know, something like twice a day would be work, would work as well. As well, you can use a separate uh, custom property for this flag with the default to off, like I said before, and then you can flip it on to catch that on new, newly onboarded customer up, okay? Okay, so let's talk about Windows feature upgrades. This part is important and in central. This is how we differentiate our, those really big releases because we have something called, um, I'll go through it. Uh, Windows feature upgrades, these are biannual updates that have amounted to new operating system versions. They're like service packs effectively. You know, if you remember, you know, Windows 7 or previous versions, Microsoft always used to do SPs, you know, SP1 to SP3. For example, they were basically like major releases. So they happen now, they're much, much smaller, but they are um, still pretty big uh, to be delivering to your customers and you're ranging anywhere from three to six gigs. This results in not only long download times, but lengthy, lengthy install times anywhere from one to two hours uh, that sometimes require multiple reboots. Usually it's one. IT administrators responsible for patch management would often be forced to run them outside of normal scheduled maintenance windows. This would then minimize the disruption to the end user, but it would also increase the administrator's workload. Now, the cool part. We have what are called feature enablement packages. As you are installing your normal monthly updates, Microsoft is adding features along the way within dormant files that will later be activated by a feature enablement package. Okay, so think of it like, um, it's gonna say like a torrent, because basically it's like a bunch of files that kind of get consumed over time and then eventually assemble the, the final package. Um, when you choose to install a feature enablement package, it works as a master switch that activates these dormant features. The feature enablement package itself can be below a meg, which means uh, download times will be slashed from minutes to mere seconds. Install times can drop from hours to less than a minute, and the need for multiple uh, reboots will be uh, reduced to just one. The good news is through uh, when patching, the good news through patching uh, through in central, the release. The recent release of Podge Management 2.8, this streamlined approach to installing feature updates is fully supported. So again, you will not see another RMM that is able to do this today. I'm sure somebody will eventually, but not today. Um, let's talk about patch reporting. So if we go into N Central, I'll go into my favorite reports. So if I go into reports, let me go to a customer. It's very, and this is also important. You have status reports. Okay, so you got patch status from the top down. I like going to the customer and doing it, but you can do it this way as well because this is basically everyone, all of your customers. But typically, when you're trying to troubleshoot patch or understand what's installed, you do it from a customer level. Go to status, and then go to detailed status. And this is where I'll go back a month or two. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select everything. And then I want to see what is not installed in my lab in the last two months. Okay, include details. I want device name. And then I want patch name. Well, maybe I want classification. I want to see if there's any security updates that are missing right, or any criticals. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I've got third party. These are all good. 
and then I can go through and see what they are. I was going to say most of them are definition updates, but it's not always the case. All right, so I'm really bad at doing definition updates in my lab. All right, so anyways, what you can see is the patches that are not installed. I have intentionally not approved those. So it's one of those things where you can see the, you know, the outstanding patches across not installed on by device and also the number of the patches with all the details um, for definition updates by device. So that's probably my go-to report for integrated and central. Um, let me show you one other one. I don't use it quite, quite as often. It's patch approvals and installs. Installation status is good too. So I'll look for um, what is approved for install. Critical, let's go back two months. There we go. And then I want to see everything, include device details, and let's include 2,500 just in case. Now, doesn't give me anything because they're all installed, I guess. Let me go back. Uh, let's go back here. This is what I wanted to do. I didn't set that up right. So let's go criticals and security updates and not installed. Oop. And do it like this. Okay, well, we're still 100%. I'm doing well, okay, but there's a, you can see a few here. Okay, so you can see that in April, I did not install one. Uh, security update for Windows 11 on May. So these will get caught up eventually, but it's one of those things where you can use these. But one thing I will tell you that um, one of the one of my partners asked me this morning is, you know, do I send this to a customer? No, please do not. Not unless you're talking about like Ulysses mentioned a customer like a thousand to two thousand devices. If they have a thousand or two thousand devices, typically they'll have internal IT. Not always. You might be internal IT. However, if they do have internal IT and you are working with a um, an IT department, a co-manager relationship, we call it, then yes, you can send them these technical reports because they can understand them. If you were to send this to Sandra, the executive ex assistant, she's not going to be able to make heads or tails of this. This is where you use the executive summary and report manager. Uh, is there an efficient method to check why updates haven't been installed even though automatic patch approval rules have been set? Ulysses, nine times out of 10 in my experience is because it's misconfigured, right? You either have over, this, the thing is, is like in, in central patch management it has a lot of breadth, but in fact allows you to quickly get off the rails, okay? So it's one of those things where I would highly recommend that you review your patch setup after this boot camp because sometimes these things can be eye openers. Uh, Eric, since you don't record this video, it actually is being recorded. I never said I, I wasn't recording it. Um, since you don't record this video, can you release a checklist guide to the various setups um, that you showed? I have thought about writing a manual. However, I record these videos and they get posted to the MSP Institute. I don't, maybe you showed up really late, but it was one of those things where there was a slide early on where I talk about resources and it's called the MSP Institute. So Eric, if you go over to uh, success.n-able.com, you click on the MSP Institute, once you authenticate and sign in, you're gonna click on content library, just type in patch. There's probably like 30 or 40 videos. So. Uh, this one is recorded and will be posted to the MSP Institute uh, probably in about two weeks, only because this is the first time I'm doing this, this boot camp um, 
as a two-part series. Okay. Now we are about four minutes over, so I'm going to kind of wrap this up really, really quickly. Um, again, what reporting is available? Again, patch status uh, detailed is probably my favorite. Um, and then the patch install status is probably my second. You may also want to look to approvals and installs, but I like this one. Okay, already did that. Anyways, there is a KB article and I have it right here. This is the one you want. Now, I would recommend opening up in Central and looking for PME error codes, okay? And it will bring you to this particular document because if you do see PME errors, it doesn't always mean that you have to uninstall it. There could be a quick tweak or a troubleshooting step to the right. Now, unfortunately, this is like one big Excel spreadsheet that you have to slide through. So um, run the Windows Update Troubleshooter, parts of the Windows Update Storage. You know, So there's a lot of factors and sometimes it's not always PME as the problem. Okay, so check out this particular document as well if you want to understand. Now, if you're getting PME errors on mass and it may also entail you to reinstall the, the, uh, the patch management engine. Please go to the cookbook. We have a script for that, okay? Don't cause yourself too many headaches for doing everything manually. I did it again. There we go. Over here. There we are. Okay. Troubleshooting patch issues. I'm not going to go into the troubleshooting of patch only because we're already four minutes or six minutes over. Um, but I do need to wrap this up. Where should you start? Document your current process and configuration. Like Ulysses just mentioned, is there an efficient method to check why updates haven't been installed? Look to your configuration. Look to your monitoring. Look to this boot camp in two weeks. Download it and review it. Because I can tell you nine times out of 10, it, when I review patch, I do this all the time. I can usually spot a problem. Okay. When when you're going through like why some things aren't working, there it's not usually the mechanics. It's not because PME is broken or WUA is broken. Sometimes that is the reason, but it's usually because you've got overlapping rules or you're not using um, custom properties correctly. So there's a lot of things that can make you go off the rails. Um, try to configure as much as you can at the SO level. Apply your best practices we reviewed today. Review your service level agreements and align them to, you know, the patches and the configuration that we talked about today. Ask questions, open cases, create forum posts, hop into Reddit. Again, I manage Reddit and I also manage Slack. If you want to invite, send me an email. Okay, it's letter J M U R P H Y N Dashable.com. Obviously, I can't invite you to Reddit. You're going to have to create an account and then uh, you want to head on over to R slash enable. But please, if you want a Slack invite. Send me an email, I'll get you in there. All right, so again, if you're still around, I know Ulysses is, but if there's anybody still around and you have any questions around patch, type it in. Um, I can even pull you off uh, off a of mute if you want me to. So just let me know what you want me, want me to do and uh, we'll get through your questions. So let's start with Ulysses, okay? Uh, before you go, can you quickly show us again how to create that custom property for patch management is created? Okay, I, I can review it quickly. Um, but again, there is a whole two out, I think it's two and a half hours on how, because there's a lot of logic behind why you create pat, or why you create custom properties and why they're flexible and how to build them within filters. I'm doing very kind of topical use cases around patch because they obviously apply. Um, but sometimes you need some background information to kind of really understand it. So that's all I'm getting at. But I will kind of show you really, really quickly, okay? So first things first, you go to custom properties, right? So what we're gonna do here is, what would it be a good one? That's a text type. Let's go into, here's a good one, server reboots. Okay, now I'm at Trey Research, so it's not editable. But if I go here, and go back down to custom properties and I go down to server reboot. We've got Monday at 1 a.m. Not defined. Sunday at 1 a.m. Sunday at 2 a.m., right? Maybe I want to do another one for 
Thursday at 3 a.m. I always like 3 a.m. I don't know, that's kind of my favorite time. And I'll do Tuesday at 11 p.m. Whatever it may be. Then all I need to do is save that. Okay, so I've got the, the template for the pro property already defined. Then what I'm going to do, um, any guide tips for detect audit patches? Yes, give me, give me two to three minutes. I just wanna get through this part and I'll, I'll explain. Then it's the filter, right? So for example, when you come into filter, you need to filter on the group, right? So if I come into device, I come into, where are you, her? Uh, server, oh, I want custom property, that's why. Duh. Custom device property equal to server reboot equal to, and then I have, you know, my default I'll put is not a, not defined, okay? So I'll cut um, server reboot not defined. So basically I need to create a filter for each one of these, okay? Then what you're gonna do, once all of your filters are created the way you want, then you're going to create rules, right? So the rule is going to be filter. I didn't save it, but if I had, oh, maybe I have a default here, a server reboot maybe. Server reboot, we'll just use that as an example. Then I'm gonna build my maintenance window for, of course, scheduled reboot 1 a.m. or I can use the maintenance window for patch as a reboot window. I can do that for 1 a.m. So. All I'm saying is that you can turn turn this into a workflow that you can make it flex and move the way you need to. Anyways, Ulysses, there's a bootcamp for this. Um, and it is on the MSP Institute as well. Uh, any guide tips to for detection or audit of patches? I don't spend a whole lot of time detecting or auditing patches per se. I'm not normally that granular. That is where monitoring should be in my face and telling me where my problems are. That is why I spent that, I got all preachy around the whole, you know, turn all this other stuff off and configure this by days. Because if you have value, if you don't have the monitoring set up correctly, it tells you exactly where you should be focusing, right? That's why you have monitoring in your system. Now, that being said, there's nothing wrong with spot auditing as well. So what I also typically do is I'll come into a device. I will literally hop into remote control. First, I'll check to see if it's telling me that everything's up to date. I'll remote control in. I'll check to see or we'll run Windows update on the endpoint. If it's also up to date on the other end, then I'm, I'm good. I have seen where sometimes and Central will tell me, hey, it's up to date. But when I run an update, it's not. Now be careful because you do have these detection windows. Right, so when Microsoft releases patches, maybe you'll get a patch or, or two. So be mindful of how often you're doing detection, right? Because if you're doing it at 10 and two, and then it's 4.30 in the afternoon, well, maybe it just came out two hours ago. So, but maybe not either. So when you get into that, then start looking through, if we go into patch, uh, status V2, start looking at this, right? Like your maintenance windows, do they make sense? Are you using a probe, right? Is this functional, right? This will tell you if it's broken or not. You know, look to, um, or sorry, new patches by age, right? Like if you come in here and click and you see something that's 45 days old, a month old, three months old, five months old, whatever, you, you've got a problem, 100%. This is where you should be contacting your PME, sorry, your PSM, 
and asking them for P, uh, um, a partner, manager, engineer. They'll get you in touch with somebody who's technical. I'm one guy. I do the boot camps and uh, that kind of stuff. But there are people who will troubleshoot with you that are outside of support that will do get into best practices. Okay, so that's another uh, option too, Eric. Zach, how does third-party patching behave if I have an I have it unselected on the patch rule, but slotted in for automatic approvals? Installs on maintenance windows, etc. How would this behave for a Chrome browser update example at the mercy of the user application ex itself? So, yeah, one second. I, my VP just messaged me. Uh, okay. Um, so it's one of those things where if you do not have third-party patch selected in your rule, you don't get third-party patch. That is final. If you do select it, you check the box. So again, if for those who don't understand what I'm talking about, let's go into rule. Let's go into uh, workstations and laptops. When you go through that configuration builder, it will set this up, right? So patch management, enable third party. If this is deselected, you do not get any third party. If you turn this on, you do. Now. Also look at, you know, there's a whole bunch of different types of licenses that are out there. Um, Zach, depends on how long you've been a partner for. If you've been a partner for seven or 10 years, you may have legacy, um, because this should be built in. If you're a new partner, this should be part of the pro license, okay? It's not always uh, that way, okay? Um, let's see, see here. Um, sounds good. Uh, this would be that sales audit you talked about. I may have already forgotten. Um, Eric, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I do do a little sales on the side as well. Um, you know, well at least for Enable, I help our sales team um, because they're not technical usually. So I usually hop on the call and become their sales engineer for an hour or two. But I do that just to kind of keep my skills fresh. Um, patch audit a new customer. Yeah, yeah, so send me an email. Uh, ask me any questions that way. I do need to wrap up. I do have to get on a call with my my big boss. So I do appreciate your attendance and everything. Um, thanks so much. And again, looking forward to seeing you on the next boot camp. Okay. Have a great afternoon, guys, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.